This is the Code of Ethics, A Promise of Professionalism. It's a class that's put out by the National Association of Realtors. And most of us have probably taken this class many times over the years. Uh, they used to require you to take it every two years. Now they have changed that to every three years. So I like to think of today's class as just a really good refresher. We've probably heard this information in the past, but it's always good to if you don't use it on a regular basis, you know, it doesn't stay top of mind. So it's a good refresher to go over the code of ethics. And um, so that's what we're going to do today. Thank you for listening to this. I know you have other options and I appreciate you being here. We do need a couple things today for class. So you need a uh, should have the participants guide that's put out by the National Association. You should also have a copy of the code of ethics with all the different articles. We'll be using that for the case studies. And as we go through the slideshow, it's not on this first slide, but usually in the upper right hand corner, there is a PG with a page number and that's the participant's guide page number. So if you're trying to follow along, that's the participant's guide number. So, my name is Janie Beck. I'll be your instructor today as we go through the Code of Ethics, our, our promise of professionalism. So, we have some different objectives today, some things we're going to look over. For the most part, we're going to refresh ourselves on what the process is when we have a either an ethics complaint or something we need to arbitrate, um, money issues, procuring cause, um, or if we have something that we need to mediate, we just have an issue that we need help working through. So we're going to look at all of three of those and what the process is step by step from when the complaint gets made all the way through the end and kind of look at what happens and how it happens. We're also going to look at the history of the Code of Ethics and how it came about. And um, it has a pretty impressive past and it's a pretty impressive living document that we're going to talk about. We're going to look a little bit about general business practices and just see how they compare to how things are done with uh, realtors. We're also going to go through the, um, apologize, no ums. Um, we're also going to go through articles 1, 2, 3, 11, and 16. We're going to do case studies on those and try to give you some practical knowledge of how the different articles are interpreted and how they work in this process. So we'll look first at the history of the Code of Ethics. And you know, it goes way, way back to when it was really like the wild, wild west. Back then, we didn't have uh, the state regulatory agencies or the consumer advocacy groups. We we're just kind of, everybody was out for themselves. And, you know, if you had a license at all as a realtor, it was as a peddler. And you know, it was it was kind of like it was the wild, wild west. And then in 1908, a group of uh, individuals got together and they formed the National Association of Realtors. And um, so 1908 was when the National Association of Realtors was formed. And then a group from this group, the National Association, decided that it really needed to have a little more teeth behind it. So they got together and they put together the Realtor Code of Ethics. And the whole idea behind this Realtor Code of Ethics was mostly to protect the public. And so they put together the Realtor Code of Ethics and that was adopted in 1913. It was a set of rules that kind of told how we do our job, what our levels of professionalism are, integrity, what our purpose is, what our foundation is built on, what our values and 
what we owe the public as realtors. That all got put into the very first code of ethics. They were very thorough in the beginning when they started the code of ethics. Now that code of ethics has been, since it started way back in 1913, over the years it does get um, changed, updated, revised, and in fact since 1989 it's been updated almost every year since then because our real estate market is always changing and it has to stay um, you know it has to stay relevant in our ever-changing real estate world so it has to get updated on a regular basis the code of ethics describes the optimum performance that the public has the right to expect from us as realtors and this expectation comes from all realtors, whether you've been in the business for five days or five years, the public has this AIM expectation and their expectation should be met with the highest, you know, highest level of performance. Um, as we talked about, the Code of Ethics is a living document. It's constantly being reviewed and revised to stay relevant in our ever-changing real estate world. And we as realtors, we really play such a key role on encouraging and protecting the exchange of property ownership and also ensuring the highest and best use of our nation's land and resources. We make a commitment when we become realtors to uh, operate at the highest level of professionalism with the most integrity. And we make a promise to everyone we deal with, whether it be buyers, sellers, landlords, tenants, other realtors, or the public. Now, business ethics. So business ethics are basically the rules, the values, the standards on which a business is formed. And um, we, our business ethics, are the Realtor Code of Ethics. That tells us how we're supposed to do our job. Um, we were one of the first ethical codes that came along. And that was way back. And the only ones that beat us to it was medicine, engineering, and law. And so we have, we have the legal codes that are out there. But what the ethical codes are, are they are a, usually a step above the legal codes. Um, you know, by law, you have to act this way, but by ethics, you have to act in even a more impressive way. If you hold a re realtor membership in any local board, that binds you to the National Association of Realtors and then you are bound by the Code of Ethics. This isn't just open to realtor members, it's open to anyone who's actively engaged in a real estate discipline. So, you know, all the other people that we need to get our jobs done, our lenders and our title people and our home inspectors and, you know, so many people get involved when we're trying to get a deal closed and we need them all. The original code was based on two main concepts, service to the public and a commitment to professionalism. So that central concept of public protection, that's the foundation of the code and what it was built on. The code also defines the professionalism that's, that we're expected to do. The, um, it's the overall concept of our service to the public. And in the code, it embodies a lot of values like honesty, integrity, fair dealing, and competency. And if you use the code to run your business, you really do minimize your legal liabilities there. The original code also did include duties to clients and duties to fellow realtors. Now the code was built on its foundation and the foundation is thought to be the preamble. The preamble of the code is right before the code and that's the aspirations and the foundation that built the code of ethics. 
So we're going to take um, five quick minutes here, and I want you to read through the preamble of the code. It's located on your code of ethics sheet right before Article 1. So we'll take five minutes, read through that, and then we will come back and discuss. What a descriptive statement. Under all is the land. This really conveys just how all-encompassing the nature of real estate is. Land is our foundation of most everything in life. Think about it. Most everything sits on land. Our homes, our business, our recreation, everything involves the land. We really do deal in one of society's most important commodities. The lucky thing is our founders did it right because they believed way back then that the more people who owned land, the better it was for our citizens and that it was also vital to our democracy's efficient function. Remember now, most of these founders, they came over from England where the king owned most of the land. So they saw how the, um, how the accumulation of land from one person owning a ton of it can really lead to inordinate power if it's only in the hands of a few. So that's why they came and they decided to divide ours up into as many people that could own land, the better. Then we've got the golden rule. There's no safer guide than the golden rule. It's the one that's been handed down through the centuries. Let's all read it together. Whatsoever ye would that others should do to you, do ye, do ye even so to them. Pretty, pretty powerful, pretty simple. Treat others as you want to be treated. Living by the golden rule is the best way to do it. There's some other things that were covered in the preamble. Um, one of the big ones was staying informed on the issues, the issues that affect real estate. One of the ways we do that here in Oregon is we have our law and rule class that you're required to take every two years. That is on all the new laws and rules that have come up that affect real estate and the real estate business. So the Code of Ethics is made up of 17 articles. The articles are broken down into three categories. Category number one, or the first category, is clients, duties to clients and customers. These fall in articles one through nine. Next is duties to the public. These are articles 10 through 14. And next are duties to other realtors. These are articles 15 through 17. You can only be found in violation of an article of the code. And of those 17 articles, each article are, is a broad statement of an ethical principle. And I have a synopsis of the Realtor Code of Ethics that was put together by NAR, and I think it makes it really clear. So I'm just going to kind of read through this for you here. In Article 1, Article 1 is, this tells what each article, kind of a synopsis of what they're set up for. Article 1, protect and promote your client's interest, but be honest with all parties. Article 2. Avoid exaggeration, misrepresentation, and concealment of pertinent facts. Do not reveal confidential facts about your clients or their transactions. Article 3. Cooperate with other real estate professionals to advance your client's best interest. Article 4. When buying or selling, Make sure your position or interest in the transaction is known. Article 5. Disclose present or contemplated interest in any property to all parties. Article 6. 
Avoid side deals without your client's informed consent. Article 7. Accept compensation from only one party, except with full disclosure and informed consent of all. Article 8. Keep client and customer funds in trust accounts. Article 9. Assure, whenever possible, that transactional details are in writing. Article 10. Provide equal service to all clients and customers and don't discriminate against employees. Article 11. Be knowledgeable and competent in the fields of practice in which you ordinarily engage. Obtain assistance or disclose lack of experience if necessary. Article 12. Communicate honestly and truthfully. Present a true picture in advertising and other public representations. Article 13. Do not engage in the unauthorized practice of law. Article 14. Be willing be a willing participant in Code of Ethics enforcement procedures. Article 15. Ensure that your comments about other real estate professionals are truthful and not misleading. Article 16. Respect the exclusive representation or exclusive brokerage relationship agreements other realtors have with their clients. And Article 17. Mediate and arbitrate contractual and specific non-contractual disputes with other realtors and with your clients. I just thought that made a lot of sense to me. It kind of dummied it down and said this is what each article's, um, you know, the point of each article is. So I wanted to share that with you. Now, underneath it, each article, there's what's called the standard of practice. And the standard of practice is there just to help you better understand what the purpose of the article is. So it helps you kind of interpret the article and support it and amplify it. Uh, the standard of practice is what's used in a disciplinary hearing and you use it to support the actions that are related to a specific article. So you can't be found in violation of a standard of practice. It has to be tied to an article. One of the best tools to get more of this practical interpretation of the code is the official case interpretations book. And what this is, is they are fact-based situations. Um, they're actual facts-based situations. And we're gonna go through several of those here a little later in class when we get to our case studies. All right, let's take a little bit deeper dive Let's go into uh, ethics complaints. So an ethics complaint deals with the perceived unethical action or conduct of a realtor. Then we also have arbitration complaints and the arbitration requests deal with contractual disputes involving money arising out of a real estate transaction. One of the most common ones is probably the fee that is guaranteed in the MLS. And if you don't get the fee that was guaranteed at the time, that can lead to a arbitration. We're gonna walk through the process of each one of these. So we're gonna look at an ethics complaint and in the ethics complaint, look at the role that the grievance committee serves in the ethics complaint. We're also going to look at an arbitration request, and in the arbitration request, we'll see how the hearing panel is involved in that whole process. And then we'll talk a little bit about who you would go to if you had an appeal. So ethics complaints, um, they deal with the perceived unethical action or conduct of a realtor. This usually comes from miscommunication, misunderstandings, a lack of communicating. And what we all want to do is try to work it out before we get to an ethics complaint. So we do have your managing principal brokers, which are usually pretty good at helping work out things. 
and we also have the ombudsman program which we'll get into a little later in this class available to you to try to work out issues before they get to the point that you have to make a formal complaint. Arbitration requests, they deal with contractual disputes and these are involving money and it has to have arised out of a real estate transaction. MLS uh, fees are a big one and procuring costs falls big into this section. The National Association of Realtors preferred way to deal with issues is through mediation. And as of 2000, all associations, local associations, must offer uh, mediation as an option to its realtors. So in a mediation, the disputing parties work with the a neutral third party, and this person is known as the mediation officer. And the job of the mediation officer is to help identify the issues, discuss the issues, and craft a voluntarily enforceable resolution that both parties are willing to agree to. Arbitration, on the other hand, it's limited to circumstances that fall within the parameters of Article 17. Arbitration typically relates to compensation and who was the procuring cause on uh, an issue. If you have an issue like that and you didn't get your check that you thought you should get, you must file a request within 180 days of closing or 180 days of the realization that a dispute exists. It might have closed last week and you thought your check was just delayed and now we're a week later. So that date would be the one that you would work off of. Arbitration can be mandatory or voluntary. And so mandatory arbitration is between, if you have a dispute between two realtors that are in different offices, would be mandatory. A dispute between managing principal brokers, a lot of times they're there to, um, on behalf of their licensees. Um, or if you had a dispute with one of your clients, those could all be mandatory things. We have also available voluntary if you want to use it, and that is usually agents within their own office, uh, realtors that do not hold a realtor membership, we still offer the service to them, or realtors and customers that have no agency relationship. So the grievance committee. Every association has a grievance committee. And the job of the grievance committee is to do a preliminary review of the ethics complaints and the arbitration request. So the grievance committee, they're the ones that decide if a full due process hearing is warranted. They're gonna look at all the information that's provided to them, and they're gonna look at it as if all that information and the allegations are true. And then they're gonna compare that information to the article that was cited in the case and see if it fits. And they also, on an arbitration, they're going to confirm that it is a monetary dispute and that it did arise out of, um, under the parameters of Article 17. So the grievance committee, they also make sure things like all the paperwork is filled out correctly, all the deadlines were made, are met, that the appropriate appropriate parties were named in the complaint. They check to see if there's any current litigation on the matter. And they also make sure that they can get together an impartial hearing panel. And sometimes in really small boards, this can be somewhat of a challenge. So if the grievance committee dismisses your complaint and they feel that it doesn't warrant a full hearing, you can appeal, and that appeal would go to the board of directors for your association. If the grievance committee approves 
your uh, complaint or your request and decides to move it on, then it moves on to a hearing panel. And the professional standards um, hearing is for ethics and arbitration. And these panels, these hearings, the professional standards hearing, it is a full due process hearing, complete with sworn testimony, legal counsel if you choose. It's very, very formal. Um, I've actually been involved with, I did sit on a ethics panel once, that was very interesting, and it did involve legal counsel, private investigators, all kinds of stuff. It was very interesting. I also was a witness in a procuring cause arbitration once, and um, that was also very interesting. Legal counsel was involved. And in procuring cause, a big thing is to show the chain of events, and there was no um, no break in the chain of events. So they had the, all their emails, all their correspondence had been blown up on these big old boards, and it was very interesting. In the end, the chain of events had been broken, and the person that I was the witness for, she got to keep her commission. The other people thought that they had been working with the buyer, but I think what happened was one of the realtors, the realtor that had been working with the buyer, went on vacation. She had another realtor covering for her, and that realtor, I think, wasn't really doing their job. This buyer needed to get in a house. A house came up. She called the realtor I was there for, asked her to get her in the house. She got her in the house. She wrote the deal. She put it together. The buyer had the right she wanted in the house she wanted to buy a house so and the chain of events had gotten broken on the other end so it was very interesting but again it's a very formal process and um, very interesting so the hearing uh, again is, is a very formal process and it starts out you both get to, uh, first of all, the hearing panel, the person in charge of the hearing panel is going to explain to everybody how everything's going to happen. Then you get to start with opening statements from both parties. Then there's cross-examination of the parties. Then if there's any supporting documents and stuff, the, there's an exchange of the supporting documents. Then each party gets to follow up with their closing arguments. After all that's done and all the evidence has been presented, the testimonies have been made, then the hearing panel will get together and they need to decide if there was a violation and they have to be very specific. Was it a violation of the article that was cited? In an ethics hearing, the respondents are considered innocent unless they are proven to have violated the code of ethics. And the burden of proof in the ethics complaint is clear, strong, and convincing. Ethics hearings and only ethics hearings, you can have um, counsel and you can have another realtor be your counsel, someone that's knowledgeable in the code. And at an ethics hearing, the hearing panel, they produce, after hearing all of the facts and the information, the evidence, then they produce what's called the findings of fact. And what this is, is it's basically a story behind the hearing panel's decision. It's a written account of how they see things after having heard all the evidence. The punishments for these things really should fit the action. So if you've, you know, a first time offender Usually it's something like a letter of reprimand, but um, depending on the action, it can go up to as much as a $15,000 fine, and you can lose your... The standard of proof for an arbitration decision, it's based on a preponderance of the evidence, and that's defined as 
evidence which is of greater weight or more convincing than the evidence which is offered in opposition to it. That's evidence which as a whole shows that the facts sought to be proved are more probable than not. There are no findings of fact in an arbitration. The panel will just award the money to the prevailing party. You also can appeal an arbitration um, hearing panel decision, and again, you would take that to the board of directors. So mediation. Mediation is a really powerful tool, and this is used to help, hopefully, disputing realtors, and sometimes realtors and their clients. And in mediation, they help you resolve the dispute um, before it gets to arbitration. This is offered as an alternative at all associations. So mediation, it's the much less formal version of resolving an issue. In the mediation, it allows the parties to come to an agreement together. Uh, mediations can be win-win situations for both parties. So mediations really help with the long-term keeping good relationships. Mediations are also much quicker and much less cost. Then we also have arbitrations. And in an arbitration, you've got a little more cost, a little more time involved because a mediator has to be um, put in place. And in an arbitration, it's not a win-win situation. There's a winner and there's a loser. In, in an arbitration. So long term, that's not real good for uh, relationships. And um, another service, so here it's kind of takes you through the mediation process. If you go into a mediation, what happens is, first of all, they're going to just kind of explain the process to you. Then both parties make their statements and kind of tell what their issues are. Then the mediator is going to identify, okay, I see these as our issues. Then there's going to be crosstalk back and forth between the parties, kind of trying to work through the issues. The mediator can call a caucus if they would like and pull one party out to talk to them separately and then pull the other party out to talk to them separately and say, you know, would you, if they agree to this, would you agree to that and work through it in that way hoping to find a solution. Um, hopefully, in the end, the mediator can find a solution that both parties are willing to voluntarily um, enter into. And if they are, then the whole agreement is put together in writing, and both parties sign it and agree to it, and it is then a binding um, agreement. So mediation is a great, is a wonderful option for, um, to get things done. And like I said, it, you know, in mediation, you can, both parties can come out a winner. You just got to compromise a little bit. So now let's talk about, I mentioned the ombudsman program a little earlier. Let's talk a little bit about the ombudsman program. And so each association does have an ombudsman program that's available to our members. And what an ombudsman is, is they are a trained neutral third party. And they're almost like a, a mediator. But they try to help the parties work through the dispute. And they can really help with communication skills the ombudsmans are used a lot of times at the very beginning when one realtor is upset because the other realtor isn't returning their calls and they call the association to deal with it. Well, the association that our staff at the association aren't the right people to deal with that, but they can send that out to an ombudsman who hopefully can help resolve the issue. So the role of the ombudsman is primarily communication and conciliation. And the ombudsman can, they can help resolve misunderstandings and they can help um, unethical conduct disputes and try to work through those. They, 
and if they what they don't do is an ombudsman is not the ones that determine if there's been an ethic violation or if somebody's if one person's um should get the um commission over the other person that's not what they're there for they're there in the very beginning stages to try to help people work through it so in most cases what the ombudsman does is covered under the national association of realtors um, insurance policy so the the what they you know they're covered for you know a lot of the things are things like people not responding to phone calls or somebody's got multiple offers or they don't think that their offer got presented to this seller or somebody's bad mouthing somebody on Facebook or things like that. But they can't do things like if a buyer and a client have an issue on a short sale or something of that nature, they're not there for that process. So like I said, the unbudsmen, they just deal with a lot of general questions. The association gets to decide how they use the ombudsman. They can use them any way they want. They can, if there's a hot issue right now, um, currently we're dealing with COVID, they could use the ombudsman to answer some general questions that might be coming in on that if they get overwhelmed. Ombudsman can help with transaction details. They can help you know, work through ethical issues. They can help with enforcement issues. They can receive and, and respond to questions about members and they can contact the member to inform them that a client or a customer has raised an issue about them. And um, if they believe that there's a big communication breakdown, they can put together a meeting and get the two parties together to hopefully come to a mutually acceptable resolution. So the only thing the ombudsman cannot deal with, one of them is they cannot deal with an issue of public trust. And public trust comes into, it refers to the misappropriation of client or customer funds or property, the willful discrimination or fraud result, resulting in substantial economic harm. The Unsbudsman program is a voluntary program and you can enter into it at any time, even if you have, um, if you file the formal complaint and it's in the process of going through, if in that time frame you say, well, let's just try the ombudsman, maybe we can work it out there. You can try the ombudsman, your, your complaint will still continue through the process. And if you are able to work it out, then you can just cancel it. If not, it will continue through and when your time comes, you will be there to, um, you'll show up for your hearing. So the ombudsman also cannot, if they're dealing with somebody and there's a perceived ethical issue there, they cannot refer that to the grievance committee. That's not their job. So they're just an unbiased third party that's listening to the sides. If one of the sides involved wants to refer it to the grievance committee, they can do that. But the ombudsman, that's not their job. Okay, now we're ready to start our case studies. But before we start these case studies, let's take a 15 minute break and um, we will meet back here in 15 minutes and get started on our case studies. The first couple case studies we're gonna do are based off of the parameters of Article 1. So let's just start with together, let's all read Article 1. When representing a buyer, seller, landlord, tenant, or other client as an agent, realtors pledge themselves to protect and promote the interest of their client. This obligation to the client is primary, but it does not relieve realtors of their obligation to treat all parties honestly. When a certain a buyer, seller, landlord, tenant, or other party in a non-agency capacity, realtors remain obligated to treat all parties honestly. Okay, so now we're going to do Article 1, Case Study 1, and the two questions you need to answer is, do you think Bob is in violation of the code, and what was Bob's obligation to grant? So pause, you've got 10 minutes to look this over and 
come back and we'll talk about the answers. So the answers to case study one, article one, the first question was, do you think Bob is in violation of the code? And the answer is C, yes, Bob placed his interests above those of the client. Question number two, what was Bob's obligation to grant? The answer is A. Bob's obligation was to protect and promote the interest of Grant, his client, and not put his own interest ahead of Grant. Okay, now we have case study number two from Article 1. The three questions you will be answering are, can John renegotiate his listing commission at the time he presents the two offers? Number two, by reducing the listing commission, can John present both offers in an objective manner as required by Standard of Practice 1-6? And number three, under Article 3, as established in Standard of Practice 3-4, is John obligated to inform Bob that he modified the listing commission prior to the offer being accepted? Again, pause, you have 10 minutes, and then we'll come back and talk about the answers. So the answers to this one are, number one, can John renegotiate his listing commission at the time he presents the two offers? And the answer is C. Yes, John is permitted to renegotiate the listing commission at any time. Number two, by reducing the listing commission, can John present both offers in an objective manner as required by standard of practice 1-6? The answer to two is D. Yes, John's reduction of the listing commission alone does not mean he cannot be objective in his presentation. Agreeing to reduce the listing commission is simply part of the negotiation process. And number three, under Article 3, as established in Standard of Practice 3-4, is John obligated to inform Bob that he modified the listing commission prior to the offer being accepted? The answer is B. No, even though John might have created a dual commission arrangement, disclosure of such to Bob is not practical given the situation. All right, now we're going to move on to Article 2, and our next two case studies will be based on Article 2. So let's read Article 2 together. Realtor shall avoid exaggeration, misrepresentation, or concealment of pertinent facts relating to the property or the transaction. Realtor shall not, however, be obligated to discover latent defects in the property, to advise on matters outside the scope of their real estate license, or to disclose facts which are confidential under the scope of agency or non-agency relationships as defined by the state. Okay, let's start with Article 2, Case Study 1, and our two questions are, do you think Ron is in violation of the code? And number two, what was Ron's obligation to Jeff? Again, you have 10 minutes, pause, read through the case study, and we will meet back with the answers. The answers to this Article 2 case study 1, the first question was, do you think Ron is in violation of the code? And the answer is B. Yes, Ron withheld pertinent information about the financial operation of the motel in his prospectus. Question number two, what was Ron's obligation to Jeff? And the answer is A, to fully disclose financial information that he reasonably should have known to be relevant and significant. Okay, let's move on to case study number two on Article 2. Questions are, number one, did Tom violate Article 2? Number two, should Tom have identified the buildings as having a revenue-generating apartment? Again, pause, you have 10 minutes to read through this and we will meet back for the answers. And the answers to this one are, number one, did Tom violate Article 2? The answer is B, yes, Tom misrepresents the property information in the MLS. Number two, should Tom have identified the building as having a revenue generating apartment? The answer again is B, no, Tom knew that the building would need to have a zoning change or variance from the building department before it could be legally rentable. Okay, moving right along, Article 3. Our next two uh, case studies involve Article 3. Let's read that together. Realtors shall cooperate with other brokers except when 
cooperation is not in the client's best interest. The obligation to cooperate does not include the obligation to share commissions, fees, or to otherwise compensate another broker. And our questions for Article 3, Case Study 1. Number 1, what standard of practice under Article 3 applies to this case? Number 2, is Lucy in violation of the code? And number 3, if Sam files an arbitration claim against Lucy for the compensation offered through the MLS, should Sam prevail? Again, pause. You have 10 minutes to read over this case study and we'll meet back with the answers. The answers to this one are, number one, what standard of practice under Article 3 applies to the case? The answer is B, standard of practice 3-2, which deals with changes in compensation offers. Number two, is Lucy in violation of the code? The answer is C. Yes, it is unethical for Lucy to change the cooperative compensation once it is established. And number three, if Sam files an arbitration claim against Lucy for the compensation offered through the MLS, should Sam prevail? And the answer is C. Yes, an arbitration panel would likely rule in Sam's favor if Sam can prove that the he produced an offer that resulted in the sale before Lucy attempted to change her compensation offer. Okay, case study number two, article three. Our questions are, number one, is Bill obligated to disclose the accepted offer to the other cooperating brokers? And number two, does Bill's obligation under Article One to protect and promote his seller client's interests mean that he should not reveal the accepted offer? Again, pause, you have 10 minutes. Okay, so our questions were, is Bill obligated to disclose the accepted offer to other cooperating brokers? The answer is A. Yes, Standard of Practice 3-6 clearly establishes that Bill must disclose accepted offers. The second question, does Bill's obligation under Article 1 to protect and promote his seller client's best interest mean that he should not reveal the accepted offer? The answer is C, no. Article 1 also requires that Bill be honest with all parties. This obligation of honesty, along with the requirement of Standard of Practice 3-6, requires Bill to make the disclosure of the accepted offer. All right, moving along to Article 11. This will be our next two case studies. Let's all read Article 11 together. The services which realtors provide to their clients and customers shall conform to the standards of practice and competence which are reasonably expected in the specific real estate disciplines in which they engage. Specifically, residential real estate brokerage, real property management, commercial and industrial real estate brokerage, land brokerage, real estate appraisal, real estate counseling, real estate syndication, real estate auction, and international real estate. Realtors shall not undertake to provide specialized professional services concerning a type of property or service that is outside their field of competence unless they engage the assistance of one who is competent on such types of property or service, or unless the facts are fully disclosed to the client. Any persons engaged to provide such assistance shall be so identified to their client and their contribution to the assignment should be set forth. And our questions here are, in addition to Article 11, which other article might apply to this case? And number two, is Leo in violation of the code? Pause, you have 10 minutes. And the answers to this one are, uh, number one, in addition to Article 11, which other article might apply to this case? And the answer is C, Article 1. Question number two, is Leo in violation of the code? And the answer is D, no, he fully disclosed to Keith that he was a commercial broker and that Keith's property was outside his area of expertise. He also recommended that Keith have the property appraised. Article 11, case study, study number two, and our questions are, number one, as used in standard of practice 11.1, does Paul have a present or contemplated interest in the property when he does the appraisal. Question number two, is Paul in violation of Article 11? You have 10 minutes and we'll meet back for answers. 
The answers are question number one, as used in standard of practice 11-1, does Paul have a present or contemplated interest in the property when he does the appraisal? The answer is B. No, at the time of the appraisal, Sean had no interest in selling the property. Question number two, is Paul in violation of Article 11? The answer is B. No, Paul provided all the appropriate information in his appraisal, and at that time he had no intention of listing Sean's property. And our last article, Article 16. These will be our last two case studies. Let's read Article 16 together. Realtors shall not engage in any practice or take any action inconsistent with exclusive representation or exclusive brokerage relationship agreements that other realtors have with their clients. Our first questions are, number one, what standard of practice under Article 16 applies to this situation? Number two, is Laura in violation of Article 16? Number three, what was Laura's obligation? And number four, is, C, is Sue in violation of, <coughs> sorry about that, is Sue in, in violation of Article 16? Whew, sorry, can't read anymore. Okay, you have 10 minutes. And the answers to our questions are, first of all, what standard of practice under Article 16 applies to this situation? The answer is B, standard of practice 16-4, and it falls under soliciting others' clients. Number two, is Laura in violation of Article 16? The answer is C, no, Laura followed the exact procedure specified by standard of practice 16-4. Number three, what was Laura's obligation? The answer is A, not to solicit Sue's listing unless Sue refused to tell Laura the nature and expiration date of the listing. And number four, is Sue in violation of Article 16? And the answer is B, no, Sue is not required to give Laura the requested information. Okay, case study number two. Number one, identify the standard of practice that applies to the situation. Number two, is there an obligation on Mike's part to work through Barbara? Again, pause, you have 10 minutes. And the answers are, number one, identify the standard of practice that applies to the situation. That is C, standard of practice 16-13. Number two, is there an obligation on Mike's part to work through Barbara? The answer is D, yes, Mike should have worked only through Barbara, Sue's listing agent. So that concludes our case studies. Um, just a couple quick things as we follow up here at the end. Um, just wanna tell you that to look for the code for guidance, use it as your model. Um, when you're asked questions out in the field and stuff, think about it. When you're asked about another agent, remember you're not allowed to talk bad about them. So keep the code in mind. The code is also available if you sell outside of the US, it's available in 15 different languages. And the code there um, and social media, so Article 12, that's on the advertising, and it does give you some good guidelines on communication. The main thing in communication and social media is to be honest and truthful and don't mislead the public. And you just want to use the code. Use it to promote your ethical responsibility. Where your realtor are, it's a marketing tool. So, um, and it shows consumers that you've agreed to a higher standard. Couple timeless tips from the uh, pathway to professionalism. We've talked about following the golden rule, teaching, treating everyone as you'd want to be treated. Show courtesy and respect to everyone. Communicate with all parties in a timely fashion. Always present a professional appearance. Be aware and meet all deadlines and be aware of and respectful, respectful of all cultural differences. The next three slides are just some um, reminders that the association has put together for you on when you're showing property, how to respect property, um, a little bit on respect for the public, and then some on respect for your peers. And that concludes our Realtor Code of Ethics Pathways to Professionalism, 
folks. Thank you so much for hanging with me through this. And um, good luck out there in the world. And I'll catch you again on another, I'm sure, in another class. Thank you.